The media is reporting Ukraine because I talked to one of the editors of a major newspaper and he said, you know, there's an old saying, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, if there are humans dying, then it's a story. But that's not a story because there's no dead body. Now, I, I'm deeply respectful of the fact that many people have so unnecessarily lost their lives in Ukraine. But there are also other things that really matter for geopolitics that we must stop ignoring just because it's not sensationalist. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we'll have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. A new world order is emerging, and in our global macro series, I, along with my co-host, Jem Kassan, want to dig deep into the minds of some of the most prominent thought leaders to help us better understand what this new global macro-driven world may look like. We want to explore their perspectives on a host of game-changing issues and hopefully dig out nuances in their work through meaningful conversations. Our guest today is very special. She is not only an economist and an award-winning author, but her family roots runs deep into the White House. On top of this, she is an entrepreneur who also finds time to brief NATO generals on geopolitics and new technologies. So please enjoy our very special conversation with Dr. Pippa Malmgren. Pippa, welcome and thank you so much for joining Gemini today for what I'm sure will be a fantastic conversation as part of our global macro series. Now, I have been familiar with your work for quite a few years, all the way back to your early morning appearances on CNBC with Jeff Cotmore and company. But of course, in recent years, I feel that there has been a shift in your focus. And to me, you have become this incredible thought leader on so many of the most important topics that the world is facing. So as you can tell, I'm very excited. I'm very grateful uh, that you found the time to uh, speak with us today. So welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And you know, it's so funny. I just bumped into Jeff Cudmore yesterday. I'd like in the street. <laughs> that is a small world. That is a small world. Now, since this is your first time on our podcast, perhaps I could ask you to maybe set the stage and provide a little bit of context for our conversation by just giving us a few highlights of your background and perhaps also a little bit about your family's background, as this, of course, is very relevant for our conversation today. And then we'll dive into some of the many different topics that we uh, we are excited to get into. Sure. Well, I guess the key things are uh, I grew up in Washington, D.C. because my father worked for four presidents and uh, he was literally in charge of the missile trajectories during the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I grew up wanting to be a, a nuclear arms negotiator because if you grow up at ground zero, you know, you want to stop that from happening. And so I've always had an interest in strategic security matters uh, because of that personal history. And he was the chief trade negotiator for the United States. So I became fascinated. He gave me a great sort of apprenticeship in how the world economy works. And then I went into finance after I finished graduate school at the London School of Economics and worked in the city and realized that people in finance don't often know very much about national security and politics and, and vice versa. So my core competency, I realized, is I speak both Klingon and Federation and can explain one side to the other. And then since then, uh, I decided instead of just writing about the world economy, which I do a lot, I try to explain it in plain English, I also um, should be part of building it. And so I've gotten into the world of founding companies. I co-founded a robotics company at one point. I've been involved in the venture capital world. And so I'm really at the cutting edge of 
what where the innovation is, and that's exciting to see people building stuff. So that's a bit exactly. of background. Exactly. And oh, and I forgot. I forgot. And then I worked in the White House. <laughs> you did indeed. Small absolutely. detail. <laughs> small, small detail. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, which makes it really fun and, and highly interesting for everyone, uh, you know, every time you, you speak. Now, there are so many topics uh, that we would like to cover today, and it's very hard to pick a place to start. But let me start with something that you wrote maybe a couple of weeks ago on your wonderful Substack, which, by the way, every listener should go and subscribe to, because it's like a fusion between watching a movie like The Clear and Present Danger with Harrison Ford and The Inferno with Tom Hanks. So perhaps you can first unpack some of the issues you see around the terms outsourcing and off balance sheet mm. uh, which is k- kind of now given me a completely different meaning after what i read you you uh, in in your sub stack tell us a little bit about that and why this is important to understand okay gosh interesting so there's what we look at whether that's a corporate balance sheet or we understand, you know, for example, looking at the war in Ukraine, you say, well, the Russians have this many troops surrounding Ukraine. And so therefore you make conclusions about that. But we live in a world where there's so much pressure on balance sheets and what people have been doing in every realm is to move stuff off the balance sheet. And so, you know, corporates move more and more of their activities through outsourcing. And suddenly you think you know what is the financial situation of a company, but you don't because so much of it is off balance sheet. Look, the financial crisis was very much about off balance sheet derivatives, for example. The the shadow banking system being bigger than the known banking system because it's all these off-balance sheet transactions. And it turns out, even in the military, militaries have decided in the last few decades to reduce costs by outsourcing to privatized militia. And so if you really want to understand Ukraine, you have to understand there is also not just the official Russian army, there's the private President Putin's army who don't wear a uniform, who are highly trained, um, and they're they're very important in this picture, but they're invisible if you're looking at the traditional military infrastructure. So the, all of these things are off balance sheet. And so it's a way of widening the aperture and giving you a broader perception of reality that otherwise would be uh, too narrow. Yeah, and also I, I think from memory at least you wrote about that actually this kind of off balance sheet in terms of military for sure, um, you know, there is actually probably conflicts between off balance sheet armies from from Russia and the US uh, or the West, let's call it that, all the way down through Africa, which is something we never hear about. As you say, it's kind of invisible. So let me stay on the topic of invisible and and take you to a completely different place because as I was preparing my uh, notes for today, you uh, you landed another great piece on your Substack um, titled Space Space, and this is definitely where we are out in the uh, in the new world. And you write about um, th- you know things like that a lot of stuff is being declassified right now, um, so that we're getting a, a sense of of what we know or the way West knows about outer space and, and aliens, frankly, um, but also potential new sources of energy. So, so if you don't mind, talk talk to us a little bit about what's happening in that area because it's also relevant for for warfare. Um, but but there are so many there's so many things to it that I just didn't realize before I read it today. So, and then we'll go get back. To Earth, uh, I, I can assure you. <laughs> and then we'll come back to Earth. <laughs> we'll come back to Earth. Okay. Well, you know, it's interesting. Yes, I was writing about the space space as an investment frontier, uh, as something you need to understand in the world of geopolitics, because we are definitely in a genuine space race now between the superpowers, uh, because whoever controls the highest altitudes with satellites also has the greatest capabilities here on Earth, and if you can take out the other guy's satellites, you can remove all of their guidance systems and their capacity to act. And we've seen extraordinary, really, warfare occurring in space. And so I've argued for a while that we've been in conflict amongst the superpowers for literally four or five years. Um, Ukraine is just the most recent manifestation of it. But 
the I'll give you three quick examples just so you understand what sure. I'm talking about. One is the Russians, of course, have been blowing up their own satellites in order to create these massive debris fields, which create all these little bits of metal, create something called the Kessler effect, um, Kessler syndrome, which has been described as razor blades in a washing machine. And they literally rip apart everything that's in that orbit. So they're very dangerous. They can take you out if your capability is in that orbit. Second, the Chinese um, have shown that they have these uh, satellites with a robotic arm, and they can go in and basically grab your satellite and hurl it into what they call the gray zone, outer space, where it just doesn't work anymore. You can't communicate. And so this competition for who has control is very big. And I would say the event that kicked off this modern war that we're in was not Putin's tanks crossing into Ukraine. The event was um, in January this year when there's a there's a internet cable it's the fastest internet cable in the world in a tiny little island called Svalbard in Norway and it's a double cable and why because satellites still have to connect to a point on earth and that is the point at which most every satellite under 5000 miles high connects to earth including the international space station and it seems that what happened is the russian military use their submarines to cut the cable uh, about four and a half kilometers apart. And that middle bit is like completely gone, right? So nobody right. can say it hit a rock or something, right? It's definitely. And it seems that there was an oligarch who had a massive vessel called the Ragnar, which apparently was over the top cloaking the military submarines from our satellite view. And when it happened, the chief of the British Defense Forces, which is really the forward arm of dealing with the Russian submarines for the United States, uh, so Tony Radkin came out and said, you know, under normal circumstances, this would be considered an act of war. And I think that is how the military saw it. So that's a different way of understanding space and warfare and, you know, and then on top of that to finish, and this is the bit that made me go very carefully and slowly as I wrote, particularly the second part of that article, there seems to be uh, an agreement uh, or let's say a consensus amongst all the superpowers that there may be intelligent life in space, and it's worth exploring that. And so I outlined all the different ways we see this happening. And one is the U.S. Congress is literally compelling the Defense Department and the intelligence agencies to declassify everything related to sightings, UFOs. They've renamed UFOs, UAPs, unidentified um, uh, uh, phenomena rather than, you know, to basically destigmatize it. Uh, and there's a guy at Harvard called Dr. Avi Loeb, who's really the most prominent and revered astronomer of our time. He's the longest serving chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard. He's, his background is absolutely epic. He's the inventor of the Black Hole Project. Anyway, his view is this is definitely so. And he says, I don't want any of your classified data. I don't want any wobbly, blurry photos from some UFO fanatic. I'm going to build my own telescopes. We're going to canvas the sky and we're going to look for all kinds of signs that there's something uh, out there. And including he's dredging up what he believes to be an interstellar object off the coast of Papua New Guinea, but very much with the support of the U.S. military. So something fascinating is happening in the space space. <laughs> yes, indeed. And actually, you also refer in the article this thing about what they're trying to find out as far as I remember is it you know is it one of ours is it one of theirs or <laughs> you know meaning it could be Russian it could be Chinese it could be US and then it could be you know really from outer space um, but maybe we maybe we do have capabilities we're not talking about um, yeah that's why very none of none of the US government references ever say anything about extraterrestrials uh, or aliens because Nobody knows. And it could be that we have in the U.S. some extraordinary weapon system that very few people know about, and that's what it is. Let's face it, the Russians and Chinese have totally developed hypersonic glide missiles now um, against which we have no known defenses. And so that's why it, so it could be ours, could be theirs, but it could be... Mm them and we don't right. know what them is but i think it's really interesting that so many people in the in officialdom are now involved with this project <laughs> 
fascinating. Jim, take us back to earth, please, with some uh, <laughs> grounded questions. I don't know how I uh, went up that, but um, let's try. So, well, let's start at the beginning. Uh, Pippa, you are by your own admission uh, an unbridled optimist, right? Which is, in this macro world, incredibly refreshing. Um, but I did want to um, kind of poke at that optimism and see how you remain optimistic, I guess, and how you and what causes you to be optimistic broadly. Um, is it the diplomat in you, right? Ultimately, uh, you know, realizing that the you know there's always a, a solution in the middle. But my, my I guess my question is, you know, referring back to the last you know time of of uh, globalization was really you know the 1860s is when it started. It was really underpinned by British statecraft and and naval power. And, you know, a lot of books at the time assume that uh, the interconnectedness of the world uh, was really such that that uh, it was increasingly Im impossible uh, for there to be a, a world war. And then yet it happened, right? You know, so in a world where things are seemingly crumbling, what gives you optimism, I guess? So it's really interesting. I am almost all the time very optimistic and see the upside of most things. But there have been two times in my career where I've been really negative. And one of them was in the year before the financial crisis. And I was very uh, adamant that we were about to see something that was kind of like the savings and loan crisis. And at the time, that sounded outrageous. In retrospect, it was a fraction of the size of the savings and loan crisis. But that was considered like hugely alarmist when I said that. And, um, and you know, it's hard for people to face trouble. So you try to just be the person that can help explain how you can manage it. Um, then the second one has been just in this last really year, definitely six months. And I wrote a piece, actually the initial piece that kicked off my Substack column. Um, and I wrote about how we're about to be in World War III. And I don't say that lightly. Uh, I think we are in it. It is global in nature. It is superpower to superpower. The media is reporting Ukraine because I talked to one of the editors of a major newspaper and he said, you know, there's an old saying, if it bleeds, it leads. In other words, if there are humans dying, then it's a story. But like my what I referred to with the cutting of the internet cable in Svalbard in Norway, that's not a story because there's no dead body. Now, I, I'm deeply respectful of the fact that many people have so unnecessarily lost their lives in Ukraine. But there are also other things that really matter for geopolitics that we must stop ignoring just because it's not sensationalist. And so... I've been writing about these two things and I found people just didn't, they didn't like it because it's, it's bad news. But it, look, if you're going to be in macro, if you're going to be involved in what's going on in the world, you have to understand sometimes things go badly and awry. And the question is, how do you get out of that? And then that's where my optimism kicks back in. And I see so many signs of innovation speeding up because of not just the war in Ukraine, but the wars, right? Because we've had a war on, on, on a virus as well, right? We've had a war on COVID. And I'll just give you one like tiny example of something I just find so interesting. Uh, Jeff Bezos always says that his best performing divisions are the ones that have the least amount of capital because it forces them to use their imagination. And ingenuity is always a better answer than money. And so, you know, like as an example, in Ukraine, we've seen um, how is it the Ukrainians, they're up against trillions of dollars of defense spending by a superpower, but somehow they're winning. And it turns out that some of them are clever and they're using yoga mats. And you're like, wait, what? Yoga mats? Well, they have a, fa a material in them that means if you hold it over your head, it cuts the heat signature so their satellites can't see you. So they can sneak up and drop stuff off, but have it blow up and get away. Well, like this is what happened with 9-11 as well, right? How did Al-Qaeda go up against trillions of dollars of American you know, defense spending? Aircraft carriers galore answer $5 box cutters. And so all of us should be thinking about what's my yoga mat? What's my $5 box cutter? What's my unbelievable leverage that doesn't cost anything, but it's ingenuity. And I just see that 
magnified through the um, entrepreneurship community, like people building businesses, this is how they think. And so it's hard not to be optimistic about what they're coming up with. I'm actually optimistic in a really kind of backward way. And uh, I think we've had building pressure in the system. Um, Niels and I have talked about this on, on other podcasts that have created a, a almost existential risk in the system and I, I fear that if it, if it had continued, uh, for longer, the risk to kind of Western democracy and, you know, the real important stuff really could have been at risk. Um, I actually see the fact that we're getting some actual conflict now when there's a time of still, um, kind of Western democratic, um, dominance, right? As a potential good thing. I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about that. I mean, the last 40 years, we've seen secularly increasing kind of inequality in the world, which has created entropy in the Western system, right? Um, and there's a lot of cracks. And it, and it definitely feels like we're in need of a going back to our original ideals and reconstructing, right, uh, the checks and balances and things that make Western democracy, individual liberty and freedom uh, exist, which have been exceedingly rare in the history of time. And, and I feel like uh, this might be the thing that brings the West together to actually, you know, challenge those. I'd, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. That's, that's really interesting. You know, I wrote a book in 2015 called Geopolitics for Investors. And at the time, people were like, who cares about geopolitics? Like, it's completely irrelevant. You know, it's, it's just, it's permanently gone. And this was also the moment everyone was saying inflation is dead and we never have to worry about it again. And I argued that both geopolitics and inflation were going to come back and we should be preparing for that. And they have now. And why is it that people got so complacent? I think it is partly that they started to assume that the state of affairs was normal. And in fact, if you look at history, most of the time you are in conflict. And we were very lucky that we had this extraordinary prolonged period after the end of World War II, which is not to say we didn't have any conflicts because we did. We had Vietnam and we had regional wars and all sorts of things, Iraq and Afghanistan. But in terms of the superpowers facing off against each other, we were very privileged to have th these checks and balances that worked for that long. And then they stopped working. And we no longer have that. And we do have a situation today where our military leaders and our political leaders are genuinely concerned about the possibility of a nuclear event, which the Russians have repeatedly threatened and certainly have the capacity to execute. And so it's a very dark moment. It's, but it's not one we haven't seen before, right? Like I said, I grew up with this. this. Um, and the good news is, in spite of all the threats, they, we didn't get a nuclear exchange or a nuclear event. So I think that's encouraging. And But it does, at its core, to your point, it forces us all to really think about what would we be willing to fight for? Truly. Um, like, as an example, it's clear Putin has his eye on um, the Baltic states and the Scandinavian states, and he's making rather overt threats towards them. And, you know, we may say, well, his, his army is not in great shape, but his navy is, and the navy is right there, right, off of the coastline of Kaliningrad and um, Sweden and Denmark. And so, um, you know, it's a, it's a possibility. And the question then is, okay, would we fight for Sweden? Right. My family are Swedish and Danish. And we say yes. And we say yes, we'll bring them into NATO and then we're required to fight for them. But it's interesting. We didn't really fight for Ukraine. And why? Because we were so afraid of it escalating into a superpower conflict. Well, that will be true again with other nations. And so, yes, it brings us back to our core values. What really are our core values? And Second, it does some other things we should think about. And one of them is um, war is a leveler in every way, including a social leveler. And it forces, I mean, we've had a huge stretch between the rich and the poor, the privileged and the underprivileged. The, um, the socioeconomic spectrum has become very wide in recent years, in my judgment, partly because of the money printing. Um, what would narrow that gap? Well, War narrows it. 
it's a, it's a leveler uh, socially. But it's also the dark, dark side mm. is, you know, who benefits? Um, you know, where are the, the arms makers that are making a fortune out of conflict? They're there somewhere, too. And so all of these things we have to think about. So I'm, I guess, yeah, if it's like a philosophical point, we're thinking about stuff that we've ignored for a long time. Yeah, I just hope you don't need war to have to address your core values. Yeah, and to your point, I mean, we, we talked about this again on another pod, but monetary policy, right? The money printing, as you mentioned, really has tighten the 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 business cycle right it has created a situation of of artificial calm i guess if you will um which has suppressed the need over 40 plus years now to uh to solve other problems right and has made certain problems bigger um particularly inequality and uh the corruption of you know absolute power corrupting absolutely internally and authoritarianism globally so that's leading to a much bigger issue now, but ultimately better now than something even bigger in 20 years. And obviously, you look back at World War One, World War Two, and and nobody, everybody wishes we didn't have to go through that. But if we had gone through that, where would we be? Right. So I think also for me, one of the super interesting things was when I made the argument in my book, Signals, um, that the money printing would spur the return of geopolitics. Money printing would bring back uh, social unrest issues because it split society. So it's kind of civil war and uh, superpower war are both. It's like, uh, you know, rubbing the bottle and the genie comes out, right? You, it's... To my mind, there is a clear connection. The more money you print, the more you are spurring social unrest on both of those levels. And of course, what I'm saying is I do hold, I do blame the Fed. I do think that they they are absolutely not understanding the consequences of their decisions. But their view is, you know, that our money printing has nothing to do with the return of war or with social unrest. And I'm like, guys, it's it's so interconnected, it's ridiculous. Uh, but th this is not the, you know, it's like being in a high priesthood when you're in the central banking world. And um, and they've got their own catechism and they've got their own kind of Bible or their their holy books of of and stories of what is true. And I I'm a little bit of a narrative disruptor there. <laughs> so yeah, we, we couldn't agree with you more here. I think we um, no. but it, the the question is, is it the Fed's fault, or, or quite simply, the fact that their mandates that they're given, right, uh, don't yeah. don't include it. But the system is definitely broken. Yeah, I want to stay with World War Three for just a few more seconds. Uh, speaking as a Dane, and of course, now that you talked about Denmark and Sweden being in the the firing line, I have two questions for you. Um, one, do you? I mean, I know this has been talked about by people also besides yourself, uh, uh, Peter Sian, who was on, on the show a couple of weeks ago. And so I wanted to ask you whether you truly believe that actually Putin will go for the Baltic uh, and maybe even including, a, 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 you know, a Swedish and a Danish island and, and, and what have you. That's one question. But the other thing that Peter Zion um, talks about, which I don't think is being talked about, uh, certainly not in the mainstream press, is that he feels that there is going to be a really hard effort by Russia to separate Germany yeah. from the rest of the bloc uh, and sanctions and all of that by by obviously playing the the, the energy card because they do have a pipeline coming into Germany directly uh, where they don't have to go through Ukraine. So uh, I'm really interested in, in those two points uh, from your perspective. Yeah, um, so on the first... Uh, I have been writing about the islands um, yeah. in the Baltic Sea. So Bornholm, Home, yeah. Gotland. Um, and, you know, most people, they're like, they've never heard of these places. And uh, and yet they were strategically of tremendous importance during both world wars. Uh, I think the Germans, they certainly were using, I think it was Bornholm for their V2 rocket testing. And it, these islands were some of the last locations that they were that they gave up because of the tremendous significance. Because basically, the submarines and the naval fleets—it's um, like a gateway, right? If you control yeah. the island, then you can get through, and if you don't, you don't. And um, 
So it's been interesting watching, uh, particularly the Swedes, kind of remilitarize uh, their islands. Um, yeah, Gotland, yeah. Gotland in particular. And uh, it sounds like such a small thing, like it's a tiny island, who cares? You know, it's got nice beaches. But it's the strategic importance from a naval perspective that matters. And we have had so many incidents between particularly Russian submarines and British submarines. We've had the Hunt for Red October going on for quite some time. It's just that it wasn't in the public eye and and militaries didn't tell you it was going on. In fact, now when you talk to nuclear what, nuclear submarine experts, they'll say the Cold War never stopped. We were always having cat and mouse games together. They've just intensified in more recent years. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's something called the Sulwaki Gap that people should be aware of. It's been considered the single most vulnerable spot within NATO. And it's just, it's this kind of 64 kilometer gap, little road between um, Kaliningrad, which is Russia, uh, on the Baltic Sea, and Belarus. And what the Russians did was to deploy over 100,000 official troops into Belarus for war games some months ago, and then it was announced they're not leaving. And so suddenly Belarus became part of this kind of um, risk board, you know, like a monopoly board of this war. And then the next thing was the, the, the Belarusians started talking about changing their constitution so that they could have nuclear weapons there and that the Russians were, they already had nuclear weapons in Kaliningrad, but they might also have them in Belarus. And suddenly that little gap starts to look really vulnerable because the question again is, are you really going to fight for it? Are you really going to risk a nuclear weapon for that little gap? But if they get that gap, then the Baltic states, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia are literally surrounded. So it has tremendous meaning for them. And those are some of the most advanced economies in Western Europe. So it's of huge significance. Um, Germany, it's very interesting to see that already you're starting to see Germans drive around with Russian flags on their cars. Mm. And, you know, Russia has um, always had a deep relationship with Germany. Germany doesn't want to be at war with Russia, and certainly not after seeing how brutal Russia can be about it. Um, and so they will always be much more into let's cut a deal than let's fight. Although it's been fascinating to watch Germany literally turn on a dime um, and announce that they are going to spend 2% of their GDP on defense, which, by the way, will make them a massive, massive military. And the interesting thing is going to be to see, does their military wear uniforms or do they adopt, a, do they become like a modern military where you don't even know who's in it because they're, they're so low key about it. And it's much more about cyber than it's about physical. And, you know, do you really care about tanks and guns if you own cyberspace and outer space back to our original subject? But I think it's not going to be simple. It's not like, and look, Angela Merkel was educated. She was Eastern East German, uh, educated in Russian, understood that you have to be engaged in a, in a sophisticated diplomacy with the Russian bear. And then suddenly now these events happen and they go, no, 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 we're with the West. Well, I think it's going to be a kind of gray zone for Germany. It's, and so it's in play diplomatically. Super interesting. Jim, I've got a completely kind of off-topic thing that's going to get me into trouble when I get to uh -huh. it, I think. Not with Pippa, but maybe with the with the audience. So I'm going to let you jump in here before I I, uh, I have the nerve to ask this one. Okay. No worries. So um, Russia obviously is the topic of the day. As you said, if it bleeds, it leads. And, and that's kind of front and center. Obviously, the thing that's in the background that we're talking about less is China. You know, Russia is the 11th biggest economy in the world. Uh, yes, it's major commodity input, particularly to Europe. But that's something that we can, as a, you know, Western global pack, kind of work through in, in a year or so, call it. China, obviously, second biggest economy in the world. And I think it's incredibly telling that they, on February 7th, right, did that joint communique together um, and stopped walking a line, which they have walked for um, really 45 years. 
as far as I can tell, the only reason that they would do that is if they have something else that they really want, right? That they're willing to give up kind of playing both sides. And that obvious thing is, you know, the question is Taiwan, right? What is your view of, of what the odds of, of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is? And, uh, you know, I, again, there's, you know, Scottish historian Niall Ferguson, who I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes. Uh, very yeah. much, you know, came out predicting that this, a Chinese move would, you know, this was back about a year ago, come sometime after the Chinese Olympics. Um, and, uh, you know, within a year or so, you know, getting towards the midterm election. Um, we're very much in that window and there's a lot of signs that that might be happening. People are kind of, a lot of people are in denial about that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this is such an interesting question. So, um, so imagine two guys in a bar. And one of them says, I hate these, I hate these Ukrainians and NATO and all these guys. I just want to punch these guys. And the other one, the Chinese guy says, you should do that. Yeah, you, you have reasonable grievances and we'll be with you. We'll be your friends. We're your best friend. And then the Russian starts punching, right? And then the next thing, the fight breaks out, the police come in, the public sees, and then the Chinese guy's now at the other end of the bar going, like, I met the guy once, you know, we were sitting in a bar, right? Suddenly there's this huge distance between them. So I think, actually, China did encourage Russia to go down this road, and they got a lot out of it. They got the most valuable stuff. They now know what our reaction times are like. They know what our decision-making is like. They understand what is the public reaction. They got really invaluable knowledge about what would be relevant if they were to go for Taiwan. So uh, don't think that they didn't get anything out of this. They did. Second, um, I think that there's something been happening in the background that's important to understand. You know, the Chinese play a long game, obviously. So, and that's been the Korean Peninsula question. And what we've seen is the new president of South Korea is quite a hawk on China, but he's only just been elected. But the previous president of South Korea, his view was, let's do a deal with the Chinese. And the deal was, China said, we'll basically take responsibility for North Korea and we'll pay the cost of managing the North Koreans. And in exchange, we want an announcement of the end of the war between the North and the South and a rapprochement between the two sides, not reunification, but, you know, end of the troubles. Because if you can get that, then the question becomes, why do the Americans have 30,000 troops stationed on the border between these two places? You don't need them there anymore. And if you can get the Americans out, then it's much easier to deal with Taiwan. So I think they were hoping that that deal would get done before the previous president of Korea was out, but they didn't get it done. Second, I also have questions about how you would take Taiwan from a Chinese perspective. You might, look, they, they have a very Sun Tzu theory of war, which is the best way to conduct a war is to get your opponent to do what you want without firing a single bullet, right? That's the smart way. And so do you really need to do it militarily? And I think maybe the answer is going to be no. It might end up being like Hong Kong. And I lived in Hong Kong when the handover to China happened. You might be able to do this without a single bullet being fired. Now, you can use your flyovers to intimidate. But the reality is that, that most of the Taiwanese middle class makes their living from the Chinese economy. So in a sense, they're already kind of bought. All right. And there are a lot of Taiwanese who would say, well, you know, one country, one system, eh, we can live with that. There's a smaller group of really hardcore pro Democrats in Taiwan, but are they getting smaller? There's a question. Maybe there are fewer and fewer of them over time. And so I think China's kind of waiting for that gradual moment when you get um, a less aggressive leader in Taiwan, a less aggressive leader in South Korea, and then a whole bunch of things can happen all of a sudden. And you could have a reuniting of Taiwan and China without having to go to war for it. The Chinese do not want to take on the United States in a battle. That is not their idea of, you know, an easy thing to do or a smart way to spend resources. Um, They'll challenge us in lots of ways, but but to provoke 
the United States, I just don't see the Chinese thinking that's a smart thing to do. So I don't think we're going to end up with an invasion um, because it's just the, the least elegant way to accomplish the task. And, and they prefer to choose something that, buy, that takes longer than something that is more bloody. The interesting part is that, you know, you, you mentioned time, you know, as you as you've said, you know, in the long term, China has generally played the long game, but they've really put themselves, in a, you know, walking over that line. And the arguments for many has been that, that it's because there's a there's a closing of a window with, you know, using soft power or even hard power in Taiwan because of the broad encirclement that's happening um, with the Quad Alliance, A, and B, also because of Taiwan slowly actually, in terms of trade, starting to step away and diversify. Um, there's an there's a add-on argument that, uh, that that's accelerating now that what, you know, given what's happened in Russia, given the commitments that, that China has made to Russia. So I, I wonder, again, uh, if, if that window is actually closing, if they, if they are committed to this, if that uh, long game is almost pushing them, uh, Taiwan out of reach if they do it. That's kind of interesting too, because one thing to watch uh, are the Russian, the Russians positioning in the Pacific Islands, not only the Chinese. Um, and so on the Chinese side, we've had them very involved, of course, in the um, South China Sea. Uh, but then there's the more recent announcement of the deal the Chinese have struck with the Solomon Islands, um, which to remind people is where Guadalcanal is, uh, one of the most significant battles of World War II. And of course, the Australians are now having a heart attack because that's pretty much on their doorstep. And that means, you know, weapon systems and uh, surveillance systems can be positioned there. Uh and then what's lurking in the background, but nobody ever refers to, is the islands that the Russians claim, the Kuril Islands off of Japan. And those also have tremendous strategic importance, particularly if the Russians and the Chinese are collaborating, um, which they do seem to be. And then suddenly you could find both Russia and China right on the doorstep of Japan. And uh, that'll give the Japanese a heart attack. Uh, it's already this, the kind of senior brass of the Japanese establishment already understand that this is a very serious development. So, you know, it's again, I, I don't know if you remember the game uh, called Risk, right? Where it's a big, it's like Monopoly, except it's warfare. And um, that is how these guys are thinking about the world. They're They're picking off parts of it and that have strategic importance. And you it's kind of like you go, well, that island's not important to me. Well, it's useful to me. I'll take that. And this is a, a global geopolitical chess match. And I say that advisedly. It's not a game. This is a match. And there are lots of ways you win chess mas matches. Intimidation is one of them. Smart forward thinking is another. Um, and that's how we should be thinking about this. Maybe just as a follow-up, because that's one of the arguments that Peter Sion makes a lot, and that is, uh, and, and speaking to to your point, uh, Jim, about the window closing, is demographics. I mean, do you mm. do you think that China and Russia um, are actually in a situation where their, you know, potential uh, ability to do certain things will disappear in in relatively sh short period of time because of demographics? Yeah, this is a a core issue. I think one way of thinking about it is because of the one-child policy in China and also in Russia, the demographics are very clear. They just don't have young people coming online. So the population is aging and it's very hard to conduct wars with old folks, right? <laughs> so this is narrowing the window of opportunity to conduct war. But there's another way of thinking about it, which I think makes more sense, particularly for China, which is if you if your economy is not delivering, and let's face it, it is not capable of delivering, and perhaps for some reasons that are not their own fault, right? Trade wars, um, COVID, like there's all sorts of things that have shut the Chinese economy down. But what really matters is that 
the public in China were willing to work for pretty much nothing if they genuinely believed that they were going to get rich before they got old. Well, they don't believe this anymore. And so the next question is bound to be, well, why are you guys in charge if you're not going to make me rich before I get old? Like, why are you in power? And that is a question China doesn't want to face. And inflation is a core driver here. Throughout Chinese history, major political turmoil always happens when inflation picks up, right? Tiananmen Square happened against the backdrop of 14% inflation, right? Double-digit inflation starts to kick in and boom, everybody's asking these questions. Why are you in charge? So if that's the situation, one way you would unite the public is to present them with a common enemy. So you go to war not because you have an international strategic objective, but because you have a domestic objective. And back to your point earlier, you can create enormous social cohesion if you are all fighting a common enemy. You, you again, flatten the power structure of the country. All the gaps between the elite and the non-elite start to disappear. And I think China has shown under Xi's leadership that they did not choose the direction of kind of more liberal Western values. They've chown, chose the direction of more autocracy. That's, again, kind of why like they like the idea of acquiring more control over North Korea, because their view is the Chinese public should behave much more like this. You guys should watch walk in lockstep much more than before. And that's just totally inconsistent with creating an economy that creates dynamism and jobs and innovation. And so, so I see the risk of war more from that direction rather than the window is closing. It's, it's, they have to act or they're going to have a revolt. Okay, so I'm going to venture into this uh, little controversial topic. Um, and uh, I don't know uh, what you have written about this, and it's not really about my little analogy uh, that I'm going to uh, lead with, um, but I do want to hear your thoughts about this. So... You know, there was obviously the big topic of of COVID, um, and to make it even more controversial, we have the topic of vaccines. Um, but it's a long winded question, as I mentioned. So, the backstory is that a couple of weeks ago, a group of Danish researchers at one of the universities in Denmark, and um, let me just remind the people listening that Denmark is actually one of the most or high, most highly vaccinated countries in the world uh, with very, very good data, uh, uh, even though I do think this data actually was international data as well. But they made the first study, as far as I'm aware, where they looked at the two groups of vaccines. So on one hand, you have the mRNA, and on the other hand, which is the Pfizer, Moderna. And, um, and that was the one that we in Europe, at least, were told that that was the gold standard and that That's the vaccines we should use against COVID. And then they compared that to the vaccines like AstraZeneca, Johnson Johnson and Sputnik um, to not only look at whether these vaccines had a positive or negative effect on the risk of dying from COVID, but also if they had a positive or negative effect on the risk of dying from another disease. So you could say that they were essentially looking at the unintended consequences from these two groups of vaccines. Now, people can go and look up the study in detail, um, but first I want to share uh, just kind of their overall results and to put it into context of, of our conversation. So what they have concluded, this group, uh, is actually that the mRNA vaccines had no effect, positive or negative, compared with no vaccines at all. But the adenovirus vector vaccine, so the other group, actually had a significant improvement, uh, which is not what we were told, uh, certainly during COVID. Uh, and in terms of the risk uh, from dying from cardiovascular disease, for example, there was a large reduction of risk in the adenovirus vectors vaccines, but in the mRNA group, there was a significant increase. Okay, so my question is not about the vaccines per se, but if we use that as an example where we now start to see evidence of powerful institutions promoting and using the wrong medicine, so to speak, in dealing with COVID, perhaps down to the financial interest of Pfizer, Moderna, I don't know, but it was the two US companies that went that direction. What if we're making the same mistakes when it comes to central banks? So what if the Fed uh, 
as someone inside the Fed has actually uh, suggested last year, I think Jeremy B. Rod wrote a paper in the fall of 2021 where he basically was saying that the Fed was looking at the wrong thing um, and this could lead to some unintended consequences. So I wanted to ask you whether you see this as a as a risk and more importantly, um, you know, is anyone that you know, because you seem to know everyone, thinking of the risk of central banks actually screwing up at this time because that's the only stress test we never did that is stress testing the central bank policies around the world. Mm. It's a long-winded question, but... So I love your thoughts. It's a super interesting uh, landscape you've laid out. The last two books that I've written have been about leadership and very specifically about why we're having so many leadership failures. And there's so many examples from, uh, you know, the Catholic Church not cracking down on pedophilia to um, Volkswagen uh, falsifying the numbers on the carbon emissions to, I mean, like the list is just ridiculously long. And and the question that I and my co-author had was, why is this happening? And we came to a few conclusions that are relevant for these points that you make. Um, and one of them is that our leaders and our society tend to prefer that we all operate from a position of certainty, that we know, we know what's going on, we have the information we need to make a decision, we're making the right decision. But in fact, we don't have any certainty. And we usually don't have all the information we need to make a decision. And I know for, from personal experience working in the White House, when we had uh, two very significant crises, one was seven of the nine largest bankruptcies in American history in one year. That was Enron and Tyco and WorldCom. Um, and one was 9-11. And what I realized is the whole thing about working in the White House, and this isn't left or right, Democrat or Republican, this is any emergency, and they're always an emergency in the White House, you will never have enough time or information to make that decision comfortably or with any real certainty. So... You have to make decisions uh, where you're doing the best that you can and you're leaving latitude in case you're wrong. And so what I recommended in my leadership books was it makes a whole lot more sense to move away from prediction, which is what everybody loves to do, right? either or, this or that, yes, it will be, and instead move towards preparedness for a range of possible outcomes, some of which will sound absolutely crazy. But gosh, pretty much every crazy scenario has actually happened, right? I mean, how many people said Trump will never win? Uh, the British will never Brexit. Putin won't roll into Ukraine. I mean, like the list goes on. We'll not have a pandemic. or So I think all of this subject matter suffers from the same thing, which is an overconfidence, over-reliance on a certainty that isn't there. Uh, second, um, uh, an unwillingness to face the fact that the data is probably going to come in with lots of different conclusions. It won't be one single conclusion. Because, by the way, that's not how science works anyway, right? Science is just a process of asking a ton of questions and getting better quality answers, but not a definitive answer, right? There are no definitive answers even in science. Um, and then I'll add one more piece to this puzzle. There's also something which is a social phenomena that's hard to explain, but it's that it doesn't matter what the subject matter is. People today have the view that you either agree with me or there are only two possibilities. You must be either evil or stupid. Well, this is no means for having a conversation or for advancing anything because you have to be able to accept that there are other perspectives than your own that might have truth. And all of these subjects that you're talking about are suffering from the fact that they are presented as these are the facts. I am right. You are wrong. You are either evil or stupid in your wrongness. And then this thing bites you because data keeps coming back and then says, well, maybe the situation isn't quite what you thought it was, whether it's a virus or whether it's a leader of a nation or, you know, pick your topic. It's all the same thing. 
or you know, I I could get in. By the way, we could go into the geopolitics of COVID, and there's some really interesting stuff there. But again, it's about perception of reality rather than reality. And today, you're not even allowed to discuss. As you say, you were right to say I'm. You're, I'm going to be careful to even ask the question because there's no room for nuance. And let me finish with this, the last thing I'll say on this. The lack of nuance further exacerbates things because it's all either or. So, for example, in Roe versus Wade and the recent um, leaked decision by the Supreme Court, which I think we still don't have the actual decision yet, but, um, you know, if you're asked, are you pro-abortion or anti-abortion? Are you pro-vaccine? Are you anti-vaccine? The thing is, what happens if you are anti-abortion, but you don't think an abortion should occur the day before the birth? Or what happens if you say you're in favor of vaccines, but if you've had adverse reactions to two or three vaccines, maybe you shouldn't have a fourth one? Are you an anti-vax? Like, and the public dialogue now doesn't allow any nuance. And so this either or makes everybody polarized. And then you can't come together to come to a, a nuanced conclusion. So that's my core answer. And that applies to the Fed as well. That you either yeah. believe inflation or there's no inflation and there's no in between. No, absolutely. And, and by the way, what you're saying there is something we discussed uh, earlier with, with Ben Hunt uh, and, 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 you know, how narrative plays in, uh, which is, is a fascinating conversation, by the way. And, and my last point on this was just be that, you know, what I worry about is that similar like where where clearly there seems to be more questions today about the whole vaccine and 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 the, how dangerous COVID really was or is, et cetera, et cetera. My worry is that if we talk about the central banks, that maybe at some point the financial world in particular, we're just going to lose confidence in their ability. Well, it, to, to, it's you know, happening and, already. And then, it's happening already. Exactly. Exactly. And and I think that opens up for something we have not seen, uh, at least not uh, in the last 50 years. Maybe it happened before, but that that's a real uh, issue. Well, Jim, you're yeah, already ahead, totally Pepper. seeing that with um, yeah. particularly young people being all over DeFi and crypto. They don't trust the system. And, and you're right. The glue that holds all this together is trust. And what we're witnessing is a degradation of trust in institutions. Yeah, I, I, I kind of referenced this before, but there has been an entropy of something that has been exceedingly rare throughout history, which is, uh, you know, the, the system of personal freedoms, uh, what, what was created, you know, in the America, right? This, uh, and it was guarded by our kind of founding fathers with checks and balances, but a very intricate system, right? Hard to pass laws, but all of that ultimately um, decays. You know, absolute power does corrupt over time. And uh, there's a need for a revitalization or a re-strengthening, right, if we are going to kind of protect those ideals. So I guess my last question here is, you know, in a world where democracy was always, was never the the quickest way to get to the right answer, right, but it was the most stable over time. In its more recent decay, whether it's, uh, you know, Citizens United or gerrymandering or, you know, you pick your your, uh, you know, or the Fed and its, and its creation and its power, uh, you know, which is extra governmental. Pick your reason for its decay, but within, within a construct where it is decaying and you have a autocratic set of governments, uh, China in particular, that, that don't have those, uh, constraints, uh, of, of personal freedom and, and the friction that that causes. Yet a world where, you know, their Achilles heel historically has been a lack of stability with, with, with all the technology and the ability to now kind of control, command and control stability as we're seeing. Do we, is democracy in decline? Um, you know, where do you see kind of the future of democracy versus autocracy? Yeah, I think autocracy is in decline. I do. I think we're seeing that autocracy is not working well. It's not pretty. It's not delivering. Um, you know, and for a lot, for the last, what, gosh, 
30 years, I've had people saying to me, you know, autocracy is the way to go because look, the Chinese can build so many bridges and roads. And I'm like, okay, but that isn't the only answer to making the economy improve, right? Back to ingenuity, back to the freedom of a human mind to explore and to invent and to create. And um, one of the things I've noticed about China and their particularly their social credit system, where basically your all your behaviors and all your actions are being tracked all the time. So if you say anything negative about the government, or if you don't pay your bills on time, or if you hang out with people that are not on the good list, all these things uh, are scores against you. And it turns out then you're not able to buy a train ticket. You're you know, you, you're not able to be on certain dating websites. Like there are all kinds of penalties you pay for your behaviors. And the problem is, how do you say to people, I want you to be fully in line with government policy with no deviation? Oh, but when you go to work, I want you to be really, really creative. Really? No, creativity is a mindset. It's not a number of hours in the day. And so I think this kind of let's all march in lockstep approach kills creativity. And China may be very good. And um, let's, uh, let's talk about China in particular. They may be good. They have a, they can figure out how to throw a lot of money at a problem and a lot of brains at a problem. Fantastic. And they've made some good progress on things. But is it really proving to be a model that's working I would say the Chinese public right now are not saying, hey, this is working great. They're not. Meanwhile, is the democracy model we have in the U.S. the best one we could have? No. Does it have fundamental inbuilt problems? Yes. One of them you cite is that we have zero system for removing laws that are no longer relevant. So imagine if your whole life you put everything you've ever bought in a closet, but you're not allowed to remove a single thing. Well, the closet's now bigger than the whole, you know, neighborhood. And that's what we have in legislation. And so, you know, people talk about tort reform. Um, I'm not even even talking about that. I'm just saying, wow, how is it we don't have any way of rolling it off? We're starting to have a little bit, but that's just recent years. So you have this messy sort of mix of things that don't add up, that conflict each other. Like we need to deconflict. That's a military term. Usually talk about it in a battlefield. We need to deconflict legislation. And nobody's done that. If you did that, then democracies would work a lot more smoothly. Anyway, I'm profoundly optimistic about the ability of humans to figure out solutions in a democratic context, even if it's noisy and messy and difficult, it beats not being able to raise the problem in autocracies. Just maybe as a follow up to that, um, before I have maybe my last couple of questions for you, Pippa. I mean, yeah, we talk about democracy, right? But even our democracy has changed with technology, hasn't it? I mean, we are somewhat more managed uh, by certain interest groups. So maybe it's still democracy, but it feels different, mm. uh, to me at least. Uh, the, you're maybe referring to the sort of corporatist uh, lobbying. Yeah, and the cancel culture, right? Cancel yeah, culture. well, lobbying, cancel culture. If you disagree, you're, you're out, like we talked about before. Um, you know, if you say anything against the vaccines, you're, you know, you're out of Twitter, you're out of YouTube. Um, all, all of those things, um, it feels different in the last few years, uh, even if we still call it democracy, right? Yeah. I'm not so sure. I think it's always been a uh, hard scrabble, fought for phenomena. It's never been totally easy. We've just had easier moments at times. Um, but I do think the willingness to tolerate dissent has been higher in the past. And dissent, the willingness to tolerate dissent is a keynote feature of a democracy. So we're we're testing that right now in in profound ways. So if we end up saying that you don't have that freedom, then we will have taken our step in the direction of autocracy. 
um, you know, that we will have said, oh, the Russian and Chinese model is better. Let's go with them. By the way, this isn't the first time we've seen this, you know, back to the Fed. You know, if you look at the architecture of the Federal Reserve Building, it's totally Soviet, right? I mean, it's it's it was built to replicate what the Russians were doing after the Russian Revolution, because we believed that if the state was going to control the allocation of capital and decisions in the society, that would be so much more efficient than just the mob. And so we became afraid that the Russians were going to win. And so even the choice of architecture in Washington from that period, the kind of Franklin Roosevelt sort of era, it all was a copy of what the Russians built. And yet our version of democracy has seen us survive. And what the Russians built, well, the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. And what replaced it is right now not supported by most of the world. So it just goes to show you, you know, that it's it's literally like FOMO. It's like fear of losing. You're like, oh my God, they're winning. We better build our buildings like theirs, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, it obviously would be completely wrong of me if I didn't just touch on on this topic with you, given your background, but but also given your your father, because I saw an amazing, what an amazing man! Yeah. I saw an interview with him uh, a few weeks ago, and he touched on some interesting things that I wanted to bring up uh, with you, so our listeners could also uh, hear hear your views. And it goes really to the the impact uh, of the Ukrainian war but on U.S. domestic policy, because we are coming up to midterms, and there's kind of two things that um, that I'm thinking about. One is, of course, you could say how uh, you know Trump was viewed and his relationship with Putin and how that may affect the Republicans. For, that's one. But your father brought up another really interesting point, and that is that given what we're seeing now, which is a clear sign of food crises around the world, that actually the farmers are being viewed in a completely different light now and could play a very important role as well, also from a political point of view. So can, can you, yeah. did you explain that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. What you see coming? Very much. So this is my dad and I, we jam a lot. Uh, and yeah. and I was saying to him, we, we were basically discussing the secondary and tertiary effects of the war in Ukraine. And whether or not Putin had thought them through. And we think he has. He knew when he started that this was not just about Ukraine. This was about creating reverberations for the whole world economy. So what are the reverberations? Well, initially, obviously, oil price goes through the roof. Um, and energy prices for Western Europe go through the roof. Naturally, that affects agriculture immediately because agriculture is just about converting energy into food. And already we see farmers um, in Western Europe saying, well, I can't afford to plant. Uh, the tractor fuel costs too much. The harvesting cost is going to be too high. And then the next thing you know, you hear, for example, the Italian livestock growers say, well, we're beginning a cull because we won't be able to afford the grain because it's going to be so expensive. So we better kill the animals now. And I said, Dad, this is like how famines start. Like you can see this. It's like a tsunami wave hits in one spot, but the pain stretches across. And that led to our conversation about what uh, he was involved with back in about 1973, when uh, the Russians had a famine. And uh, we decided to take, to basically encourage our farmers to grow a lot more wheat. And can Canadians, Americans, I think also the Australians, and we decided to subsidize our American farmers in order to give the grain to the Russians. Why? Because, you know, look, we just signed a bunch of peace deals with them. We were trying to be in a dialogue. You know, when when Nixon sent Kissinger to Beijing, he sent my dad to Moscow. So my dad was right at the heart of this whole trying to re-engage with um, the Russian bear. And so saving them from a famine was not only the humane thing to do, but smart if you wanted to make friends. And it worked beautifully because all the American farmers were super happy, of course. Um, remember in America, 
rural farmers anywhere tend to be Republican and urban dwellers tend to be Democrat. It's not 100% true, but it leans heavily that way. Today, if you were to subsidize the American farmers, you would actually bring them into more mainstream politics, which perhaps would be a wise thing to do because they've been becoming more extreme in their views and integrate them into a world that actually still is global and where they still do have a role to play and an important heroic role to play. I mean, Russia and Ukraine are the you know, uh, fourth and fifth largest providers of wheat in the world. The last time we saw wheat prices do what they're doing now, um, I wrote about it and said, we're going to have social unrest in the Middle East. And then next thing you know, we had the Arab Spring. This is worse. This is much bigger price movements. And it's not only going to be wheat, it'll be all through the food chain. So so we were jamming about, okay, what could we do now? And the biggest problem with the strategy is not that it wouldn't work. We know it works. It worked in 1973. The problem is most of our politicians are thinking about my press conference tomorrow. And I'm talking about something that will happen. If we, if we act now, we can save the world in a year. And that's just too far out. There are time frames which is just insane, let alone trying to fix, I don't know, the global pension problem, which requires you to think 30 years in advance. And that's one of the core problems with the world economy is our time horizons have collapsed to such an extent. It's hard to do problem solving. But yes, again, back to the risk board. You can see it coming from a mile off. We have the capacity to solve this problem, but we have to act now. And I think Putin knew yeah. this, and this was part of his war effort was, you know, I'll hit you where it hurts. I'll hit you literally in the food and energy supply chains. And he has. Yeah, no, absolutely. I want to end on an, on an upbeat note. Um, and uh, and it's one thing that you do uh, write about as well. Um, and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about it. And that is, you know, with the changes of demog uh, uh, demographics, but also with technology, et cetera, et cetera, you write about something you call the jobs of tomorrow. And I actually think that's a really positive way of, of uh, rounding all of this, uh, bringing it together. Um, what do you see when it comes to to that part? And, and especially for, for those of us who, who have kids, uh, my, my youngest just turned 18 a couple of days ago. So they are the ones who are looking for the jobs of tomorrow in a few years. So what's uh, what's in store for them? Yes, do you think? exactly. You know, it's funny. It's hard for people to get their head around a broad concept like innovation. So I, even though it's happening on an epic scale, um, so I try to bring it into practical things. And so, you know, as these two articles, I tried to outline, you know, there's all this stuff going on in space. And there are going to be a ton of jobs related to space manufacturing, space mining. Um, it, there's so many things, it's even hard to imagine it. But maybe for something that's literally more grounded and down to earth, I wrote a piece called Mushrooms. And people are like, mushrooms? What are you talking about? And I literally went through and described, here's a whole sector of the world economy that no one thinks, oh, I want to work in this sector, which you call mycology. And if you do suggest this, the first thing they jump to is, oh, you're talking about psychedelics. And I'm like, no, no, no. I am talking about packaging of consumer goods. Things like the carton your eggs come from. Increasingly, mushrooms are being used to make packaging because it's by biodegradable, they grow unbelievably fast, they fall back into the earth incredibly fast, and there are enormous innovations being made in this space, including uh, Hermes, the famous, you know, Birkin handbag maker out of France, has started working with mushroom leather and making leather goods basically made out of mushrooms. And I think it's um, uh, Adidas, Uh, you know, the Stan Smiths, they're made of mushrooms, right? Shoes made out of mushrooms. Um, I talk about foraging, which has come back since crypto in a major way. And there's a wonderful book that was written a few years ago. It won all the top 
prizes for science writing called The Mushroom at the End of the World um, by uh, Anna Lohap Singh. And she wrote about how the Japanese, the Cambodians, the Laotians from the Vietnam period, they had no English, no way to make a living, but they knew how to go into a woods and find the most valuable mushrooms that the top chefs in the world would want and how to ship them. And actually, you can make a living as a forager, and people do. And this became a huge thing, particularly in Britain, where I live. Foraging is a thing, right? And then you could go on. People are making bricks out of mushroom. Makeup is like the cool new makeup is mushroom-based makeup. And then there is psychedelics, which is, you know, coming into its own. And if you think a ton of money's made in medical marijuana, watch what's going to happen in this space. And that is a whole new sector. And so now I've told you about something that at the beginning you would say there is like no possibility that there's a whole new sector in mushrooms. And yet I've just told you, and that isn't the half of it, of what is happening in that field of, of endeavor. So I think that's like, there are hundreds of new sectors in the economy like this. There are millions of new jobs that no one could imagine 20 years ago that will definitely be employing people tomorrow. So I'm, I have, there's like zero doubt in my mind about that. Humans are fundamentally innovative. We always come up with new stuff to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, as I said in the beginning, there were so many things and directions we could have gone with our conversation, but of course, time, unfortunately, is somewhat limited. But I do want to ask you, uh, you know, here uh, as we're ending, um, if there's something that we uh, we forgot to bring up that you think is is really really important as we uh, sit here, uh, you know, in 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 early May of 2022, is there something you just want to bring up towards uh, the end here? Or yeah, there is one thing. So I've been banging on about inflation for really since about 2015. I started saying, you know what, this is coming back. And it did begin at about that time, and it steadily increased. People are like, oh, you were wrong, there was no inflation. But if you look at the numbers, we went from pretty much zero to about 2%. And now that doesn't sound like very much, but if you're a poor family, Zero to two percent is an inc a massive, incredible change in your standard of living, and that's enough to push people from um, proteins into cheaper calories, and it helps explain why we have a healthcare and obesity crisis now. And it's a massive change if you're a pension fund. The allocation you're going to make with zero inflation is very different from 2% inflation. And now, here we are in a world where countries like Germany are reporting nearly 8% official inflation. And remember, inflation is an average, which means some people are experiencing double that and some people are experiencing half of that. So inflation is real and it's really hard to kill it once it's back. So... The question is, what do you do about this? And I think that Warren Buffett had the right answer on this one. He's not right on everything, but he, he has a lot of right answers. And one of them was, the best inflation hedge is investing in yourself, investing in your own personal skill sets. And if you can learn more things and get paid because you know more stuff, that's the best inflation hedge. And that coincides with another phenomena today, which is something called the knowledge doubling curve that was invented by or, or uh, you know, sort of brought to the world by Buckminster Fuller, the famous um, uh, architect who built the geodesic dome. And he realized that the pace at which information is hitting us is doubling all the time. So in the year 1900, it was doubling every century. By 1945, it's doubling every 25 years. By the mid 80s, it's doubling every 12 months. And IBM has now confirmed that as of 2020, the amount of information is doubling every 12 hours. And so if you feel like you can't read enough to keep up, in fact, why are you listening to a podcast? Because you can't read all this, right? It would take too long. And so what does that mean? It means you have to start getting in front of that knowledge doubling curve by learning more. You've got to become more 
competent and able and fluid in a wider range of subjects in a deeper way. And so those two things come together. The fast pace at which the world is moving and the fact that inflation is on our horizon, everybody needs to be investing in their personal skills. I think that's a wonderful um, place to uh, end our conversation. And this has really been an absolutely wonderful conversation, Pippa. Thank you so very much for sharing your experience and adding to our knowledge curve um, doing this today. By the way, make sure you follow and subscribe to Pippa's work over on Substack and on Twitter. As you can tell, of course, uh, the links will be in the show notes of today's episode. And um, as you can tell from the conversation today, we are truly living in a global macro-driven world. And it is perhaps more important than ever before to stay well-informed. From Jem and me, thanks so much for listening. And we look forward to being back with you on the next episode of the Global Macro Series. In the meantime, take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.